today we are going to see the quick overview of Vertex AI, which is mostly used for data science and ML ops. So uh, this is a product by Google, which is integrated or it's part of a Google Cloud Platform, which is helpful for protectionizing ML along with uh, Google's own best practices and tools integrated with that. So if you see this slide is prepared by Cash Sato, who's a developer advocate in Google Cloud and no contents belongs to me. I'm just using their own content to present this to you all. And this is the agenda. So first we will start with what we can do in the area of data science with Vertex AI, then what they are doing as a part of MLOps in Google. Then how we can do that MLOps practices in Vertex AI pipeline. Along with that, Vertex AI have its own feature called Feature Store, then model monitoring and prediction. Finally, it's having its own matching engine, which we will see how it works. So this session is going to be around one and a half hours where we'll be learning a lot of things. Mostly the uh, reason behind why they have a end-to-end -end ML platform and what they are doing with the help of the platform and how it's helping us in productionizing an ML model. Uh, that clear view we may get at the end of the session. So the first part is data science with Vertex AI. So what is Vertex AI? It's a most comprehensive approachable, intelligent, and powerful suite for enterprise data science and machine learning. We all know data science and machine learning are two different verticals, but working together hand in hand. And uh, the people who are working also, most of the people who are working in data science may also work in machine learning, vice versa. And the tools we are using, uh, there are varieties of tools we are using in both the fields. And they are trying to create a comprehensive platform, which is helpful for both data science and machine learning area. They are already having Google Cloud Platform and they are planning to leverage these areas inside the Google Cloud Platform. So they are creating an end-to-end -end machine learning platform, which can do the job of both the data science as well as the machine learning related activities. So if you see here, this is the overall view, how the, where the Vertex AI is. So it's a kind of combination of AI solutions that Google already have, which they are putting it on GCP and they are providing some customizable options to us through Vertex AI. And if you see here, we all know uh, in an overall machine learning life cycle, we have different people involved with the different roles. You know, there will be a product manager who will be working on the uh, business analysis requirements, all those things. And there will be a data analyst who usually analyze the data, mostly working on queries. And the data engineer is to clean the data and help us in getting a useful data for our training. The role of data scientist is to create the model and the ML developer usually works on training and analyzing the models. And we have ML engineer nowadays mostly working on the DevOps part. So different uh, roles, different people are working in different activities throughout the ML life cycle in productionizing the machine learning application. So it's not just that if you know data analysis or uh, data cleaning or pre-processing, Nowadays, the industry expectation is uh, we should be clear with uh, all the concepts. At least uh, we should have some hands-on experience throughout this life cycle so that the industry expectations are fulfilled for the role that we are expecting, that they are expecting mostly. So other than product manager, one is expected to work on all these kind of five different verticals to create a machine learning application. And you know, whenever uh, we are trying to adapt AI, usually we call it as AI absorption strategy, right? So I want to have an application implemented with artificial intelligence. So I can consider three of the major categories. So one is use artificial intelligence out of the box. 
out of the box means I'm wrapping my application with the existing AI solution to maximize the value that AI delivers into my business workflows. I already have some machine learning, sorry, I already have some application and I want AI to leverage its business value. So that is the first one. So in that case, uh, I'm using an existing AI solution. So here three things we have to consider while adapting to AI in our existing or new application that we are developing. One is uh, how fast we can do it. Second one is how much effort we are spending it. Third one is what amount of customization is allowed if you are adapting to any of these three verticals. So the first one using AI out of the box. So we can quickly use it. It's a kind of plug and play method and very less effort is required. But in the meantime, very less customization only possible. And the second one is Deploy custom AI to extract the value from data and differentiate. So in this case, you know, when we have already data and we want to make use of our data and to extract the business value from that with the help of AI. So it's a kind of, you know, some work we are doing on our own data. So that implementation speed, it's a moderate. And of course, we need some amount of effort. And customization is uh, pretty much possible on most of the areas because solution is someone else, but uh, data is ours and we are adding our data over the solution to get the desired outcome. That is one way. And the third way is building an end-to-end -end AI solution for our own application. In this case, you know, we have to do everything from scratch, which means we can't quickly productionize the machine learning model. The speed is very slow. And the effort we are putting right, that is again very high. Uh, it's not very easy to build an end-to-end -end AI model or the application, which is work hand-in-hand -hand with our traditional application. And the third one is a high amount of customizable. Of course, we are the one building the, each phase of the uh, model or the application. So any kind of customization we have in our control. So whenever we are trying to adapt AI or AI absorption strategy while we are defining, either uh, of these three ways we can follow it depends on our requirement. And also it's not just our requirement, we have to consider how fast we have to implement, how much effort we can put and what amount of customization we need on that specific application in the future. Okay, so now if you see Google Cloud, because this application is part of Google Cloud, right? So now Google Cloud is already having a lot of AI related solutions. We all know already. Uh, long back, uh, we were having AutoML and uh, it's supporting uh, BigQuery and the other stuffs, which is helpful in uh, data analysis. So if you see Google Cloud, the similar way. It's already having pre-trained APIs and AI solutions. So we don't need to train anything. It's just that we can directly get the API and we can start using it. So example here is an object detection API. So Google is having already an API as a part of its AutoML where we can just use that and directly make prediction. Training everything is done already. So I'm relating these three examples, you know, relating with these three strategies. So first strategy, it's a kind of directly using the available API. So deploy custom AI, it's nothing but, I have data, but uh, custom models, already pre-trained models available, or uh, I'm just training the model with AutoML. It's just that automatically we'll train and ready, a ready to productionable model, we will get it. That is under the second part. The third one will be, the end-to-end -end pipeline, whatever I was telling. So here we need to have the data analysis, the data science, machine learning, including the deployment part of the ML ops. So Google Cloud is already offering all these services individually, but now we need one solution. So for that only, we are discussing about this solution and we are seeing what is available here. 
So the first part is auto ML, which was there earlier. Now it's integrated with Vertex AI. So it's a kind of no code, low code workflow where we have varieties of models already available or we can pass our data and train the model quickly. So it's uh, dealing with the vision, video processing, language processing, tabular data, forecasting, or uh, handling huge amount of data through BigQuery or translation related models. It's all already available as a part of AutoML. So this can satisfy the phase one of whatever our discussion. Second thing is, no, no, I need, I have my data. I need some kind of custom training on the existing workflow. In that case, uh, you know, they are having three categories. First one is for experimenting, which is nothing but the data processing. Second one is training the data. Third one is deploying the data. So they have three verticals along with uh, multiple jobs and multiple uh, provisions they have to have data analysis, training and deployment. This is providing some amount of customization. Other than that, uh, they have additional metadata store, model monitoring, explainable AI feature store and ML pipelines. And currently there is something added called workbench also. So these entire stuffs, we are going to see this in this presentation and what they are doing and how they are doing. And this is what we are going to see. This is the big picture, what the Vertex AI is having. And if you feel like the uh, mid layer, which you want to have more customization, uh, it's providing opportunity to build our own pipeline, end-to-end -end AI pipeline, but quickly with the help of Google Cloud. So often I would like to take a pause and uh, ask you if you have any questions. And meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and stop me and ask any question. So if you have any question till now, please let me know. Yes. Hi, Google Krishna. Okay. Uh, how it is different from uh, Firebase AutoML? Firebase AutoML, is it? Yeah, yeah. Five yeah. is also providing like a uh, image vision. Computer yeah, right. So, services. but for the uh, enterprise level uh, ML operations or the solutions, Firebase will not be sufficient. Firebase is a kind of uh, quickly creating an application with the machine learning. It's very much helpful. But if you if you see like a uh, time series data or uh, uh, TVs of data which you are training from which you are predicting that and Followed by that, if you want to provide some feedback to your machine learning model in such a way it's learning or tweaking it where you are doing hyperparameter tuning and all, such things may not be possible in Firebase if I'm not wrong. There is no feedback mechanism available. It's a kind of you are training once, putting uh, in your deploy, I mean, deploying it and using it quickly through APIs. But here the entire life cycle will be covered. So that is the major difference here. And it's enterprise level scale. Uh, you don't need to worry about the amount of data you are doing. And uh, again, the model comparison, gating criteria, there are so many things here. Uh, if you see the overall ML of life cycle, every time or uh, periodically or uh, sequentially, we will get the data. It's a kind of streamlined data or uh, time series data or batch data. And this is continuously picking it, training it, learning it, and improving its own accuracy. But there, you know, you will have to replace the model in case of Firebase. So it's like uh, continuous integration and development of model. Yeah, it right. will read it. Oh. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? It's available from last year. But it's just uh, you know becoming very popular nowadays uh, because it's providing an end-to-end -end solution. It's a kind of managed ML of solution, I would say. If you want to do our own ML of pipeline, it's a painful job, and we need a lot of expertise. But uh, as we anyway going to use a cloud for machine learning, for training data processing, and they are providing uh, very flexible integration with this managed solution where you can connect the other cloud-based solution along with this pipeline. Okay, so it's like uh, 
AWS Sage Maker like that. Yeah, uh, maybe you can take it like that. It's like AWS Sage Maker where all the phases of machine learning is covered till the deployment, right? Okay. Any other questions? All right. So if you see, this is the overall ML development life cycle. So we will break it into two parts first and we'll see how Vertex A is performing or helping in each of the parts. You know, uh, mostly it's going to be a data ingestion. We'll be getting continuous data, right? And we'll be kind of doing an analysis and we'll be doing small transformation on the data. We usually call it as data pre-processing. And if it is labeled the data, then fine. If not, we will have to do the labeling task. And sometimes uh, it may be an unmanaged data set also. And uh, we will have to uh, perform a lot of cleaning activities or transformation activities. So that is first phase. The second phase will be what we will do. We'll be kind of doing training using existing model in AutoML or we'll have our own code. Own code means uh, uh, maybe you are using any of the uh, deep learning algorithm or machine learning algorithm to create your own model. Then we'll, we'll be having multiple models continuously because data is coming continuously and it's being trained continuously. Different versions of model we'll be having in the real time. We will be uh, kind of doing an evaluation or comparing the accuracy of the model and uh, we'll be deploying the best model always. Sometimes we do rollback as well once we get the another best model and we will be keeping that as the latest one. So it's a kind of decision making there where we will evaluate the model and pointing that to the uh, uh, predictions or the endpoint. In endpoint, you know, again, it's going to be uh, individual predictions or batch predictions where we'll be having lacks of points given to predict it or individually if it is an end user application. So if we are taking a pick and trying to predict it right in Google Lens. So it's something like that. It's uh, going to the server and uh, giving us a prediction result. So this is what the overall uh, the life cycle is. But here first let's see the first part and wherever we are having the data engineering till the training or creating the custom code for a model we are having it as a data engineering. The rest of the part, it's called machine learning or ML engineering. First of all, see how Vertex AI is helping in this area. As I told, we have something called Vertex AI Workbench. You know, where we are storing the data, we, are, we may store it in our cloud databases. See, we have BigQuery. So, from this, we'll be having the provision to directly import or executing the query in the form of uh, ML prediction, and we can convert that at a machine learning model. So they are kind of providing a notebook here. And from this notebook, we have an opportunity to write our queries and get the data. That is one thing. And here itself, if you see, the surface is Vertex AI Workbench. I mean, the notebook is running in Vertex AI Workbench, but it's interacting with our BigQuery for data as well as analytics. For an analytics, uh, you know, Google Cloud itself having a Spark, Apache Spark, for which uh, uh, we will be able to leverage it and we can do kind of data analytics there. And further, for a machine learning operations, it will come back to again Vertex AI. So it's a kind of integration of multiple solution. And uh, Dataplex also can be used as a backend. I think it's already using Dataplex as a backend. And uh, if you see here, what are all the uh, first part, right? What are all the existing or easily deployable A application available means? For a vision, uh, we have AutoML vision, video intelligence, AutoML video. It's all kind of, you know, prediction one or what should I say, image processing or video processing and it's giving us a kind of analysis or prediction. Then with respect to language also, we have translation related APIs. And for 
conversation related api it's a pitch to text or text to speech we have dialog flow integrated and for structured data it's going to be a simple regression uh, logistic regression kind of structured table data uh, we have auto ml related table so these all provisions by default available where we can just to give the data and easily we can deploy it we don't need much customization there and if you ask me why google itself having already predefined best in class models for this kind of specially trained i think they already trained here and it's a kind of world class or proved models where we just can directly use it so there is a question here yes they call it as model zoo here so they have these many models linear regression logistic regression these models are best in class and this is how our auto ml workflow works yeah google actually so uh, so sick shanmugam uh, has some question in yes, chat yes. so galaxy working is like jupiter notebook yes it's integrated work yeah you are right so it's exactly like our jupiter notebook but it's integrated with the other gcp resources or services we can pull the data uh, like big query we have right so uh, we can use it or if you have uh, database services if you want a storage where you have all your images or video files you will be having the option to use it it's exactly like that so auto ml workflow is already uh, you know it's nothing but uh, they already have a, a best in class models uh, where we are just uh, having our data first we are defining the data schema and the target analyze your input features so we can have our own feature set we are training the model where we have feature engineering model selection hyper parameter tuning this is all done automatically that's why we are calling it as auto ml then evaluating model behavior it's like we are doing prediction then deploying is also we just need to select the options what kind of deployment we need and it will automatically take care of deployments so this is one area the first part where we just can give our data and we can use the existing model and uh, they are proving why their algorithms are best in class here so this is one of the example nas neural architecture search okay so they are uh, comparing this with uh, all other models on the same category uh, and they are proving their models are best in class if you see uh, latency wise and the and they are uh, comparing with other metrics and they are plotting against all the expert models which are in the industry so if you see here uh they have a 22 30% less latency for the same quality and 8 to 10% lower error rate for the same latency and uh, they are just having uh, um, less number of weeks i mean nas models in two weeks versus months gpu time it's about uh, the training the model uh, it's uh, efficient to quickly train the model uh, whereas it's taking months and years to train for 10k architectures but it's just taking two weeks so they they are having a lot of statistics and metrics to prove that their models are already best in class so our way is to just to go and pick the model and train with our data it's nothing but their own code right uh, we are just going to use it and uh, how the forecasting is work on time series data and deep learning also they have models for deep learning you know, mostly on a kind of whatever we discussed vision api or video text or dialogue text to speech conversion so those are all they are having it if you see uh, product metadata uh, they will be having lot of features trained with that and uh, uh, demand drivers uh, it's just a for, for a shopping website uh, they are trying to predict it i mean forecast it and what they are considering this is a quick example what it's doing so machine learning models understand rich metadata i mean their models metadata here examples are like uh, the type of dress 
and uh, its own property and uh, yeah they mentioned right lightweight pattern uh, long sleeve short sleeve v neck these are all metadata about that uh, overall patches of the dress and uh, relationship between the products and if you see the demand drivers uh, when the demand is increased when the demand is decreased these are all other driving parameters related to the sales prediction right so price competitor price how much promotion we are doing holidays or the other events then store related data also important it's a small store large store how many how much collection we have how much people are visiting that area and there are so many things a medium horizon uh, the data for 12 to 16 months and uh, uh, it's a forecasting means it's just that how much I need to keep it stuck for the upcoming season. So that is what going to be output medium horizon or law, short horizon for uh, zero to eight weeks in season planning or 12 to 16 month pre season planning. So they are taking a product metadata demand driver store data as an input and they are trying to forecast it when they are giving us an output for pre planning. It's uh, just that it's giving all these things. How much order I have to put for upcoming season and uh, how much new items I have to buy, how much existing models I have to buy based on the previous data, whatever we set for training. It's just an example. So what they are trying to highlight it, it's understanding rich metadata, any number of metadata that we can give it as an input and it can convert into a code and it can further decode it and uh, give us a very useful output. This is a, again a work well with the time series. Time series means every day we have such data in the store and we are continuously feeding it every minute. Whatever the customer is purchasing, we are feeding it. It's continuously learning and will giving or changing the updated forecasting. And now coming to the big query ML, you know, it's very simple that uh, we can do machine learning. Uh, using BigQuery as well through simple queries. So the, here is an example because uh, you know at the end every machine learning model is nothing but a you know, combination of multiple queries, right? Uh, or uh, it's a kind of small piece of Python code only through which we are getting some inference. So BigQuery is having a BigQuery ML where we can create model using queries. It do have all uh, types of models. Here it's linear regression there is an example shown here and uh, it's uh, directly taking the or it's going to the data and it's getting trained that is the beauty of it i trade the models in sql in bigquery to increase the development speed we are not uh, taking a copy of the data to our premise and we are training the model rather model is going and learning from the data that is one important thing which is increasing the development speed we, can, we don't need to go to the uh, Jupyter notebook with a lot of transformation, pre-processing and then model training. It's very quickly we can do it here. And uh, it's auto scalable, you know, and all the ML related tasks and uh, metadata storage, nothing you don't need to worry. Intermediate staging, you don't need to worry. It's a built-in infrastructure. You, just that you are writing query using the model and you can directly start doing prediction. So first of four lines, if you see in the example or um, model, the next two lines while we are executing, it will be a kind of prediction based on the data trained from the previous, uh, I mean, existing data, it's training and it's giving us a prediction. I think this is for a Chicago taxi data set. So it's a, another simple way of doing it, but uh, it's just to validate the model. It's not a productionizing the model. They are telling that it's a quick way of building a model using BigQuery. It's a secure, it's a compliant, it's directly happening in Google Cloud infrastructure. We are taking a copy of the data. We are directly using the data in the BigQuery and directly creating model trained. And it's supporting, a, I mean, a structured data model mostly. If you see here, either regression or classification mostly uh, DNN regression, booster trees, I mean, XZBoost and table data. And for K-means clustering, 
a time series forecasting is available matrix factorization is available it's mostly using tensorflow for its own backend for regression purpose uh, classification also the similar thing we have an option to save the model we can import the existing model we can export the model also but it's not supporting something like vision api all those things but it's a quick way of because uh, you know in a big a big query what we will have we will have a structured data right from the data we are quickly creating a model and we are forecasting something or predicting something it can be either regression or we can classify as well using classification models now coming to the vertex ai so here again uh, we have multiple options to train the model if you see we can define the model we can choose the training method and uh, it's having a lot of container images uh, where it can quickly scale and train it according to the volume of the data so there are pre-built containers available and it's supporting a different types of run times uh, gpu tpu all such things graphics card related steps or if you want we can create our own custom runtime using custom containers example you are training a deep learning framework with the help of tensorflow you will be having an option to select it and it will just uh, give you a package path as well as the module code which module you are going to run it and it will directly pick it and it will start training data source we have to give python module we have to give it will use google cloud infrastructure and can train the model it can increase it sorry increase or increase means it can scale up its own it can quickly train it and it can automatically descale it once the training is completed so they are calling this as if you see here they are calling framework of your choice yes we can select our own framework uh, i think i can directly go to vertex ai so we have to go to console.google.com and if you are doing it for the first time we have to enable the ml api enable api option will be there vertex ai and there are so many modules available in vertex ai if you see here dashboard is the one which is showing the overall view how many models we trained it so far and all its performance prediction everything will show currently i don't have anything so it's not showing anything in the dashboard and coming to the data set so under data set uh, we can create any type of data set so if you see here it's supporting image data set and while uploading the data set itself we are defining what kind of model we are going to have is it going to be a single label image classification multiple label image classification or object detection or segmentation so what kind of usage we are going to have it so we'll select and accordingly we can upload it we can have a tabular data also it's mostly used for regression or classification or sometimes forecasting text related data we can have it here again they have the split like single label multiple label classification extraction or sentiment analysis so it depends on the use case uh, we have to upload under the category they are calling it as objective of the data so and video again it's mostly video action recognition or video classification sometimes object detection this is first thing and the second thing here region we have to select because the pricing you know they are having a region wise under the advanced one uh, it's all having encryption also once you upload the data it's having uh, or it's storing it in the gcp in an encrypted format so having its own managed key option for encryption or we can upload our own keys as well where it's called a customer managed key so under data set itself there are these many varieties we can name the data set and upload it we can have any number of versions also and currently it's a kind of static data we are directly uploading it even if it is a streamed data we have option to directly connect with the existing data set 
before that i would like to show you the pricing also vertex ai pricing so how how it's being i mean calculated uh, the price because here we are doing lot of actions right right from the uh, data cleaning model training prediction so many things we are doing but if you see the pricing they are uh, pricing for only these three activities whenever we are training the model they are calculating the price whenever we are deploying and using an endpoint they are using a price i mean like api calls sorry api call. prediction means api calls deployment means uh, where we are deploying it so during deployment uh, uh, we may use the system resources for which uh, the cost will be incurred and while we are making predictions uh, according to the number of predictions be it a batch prediction or individual prediction the cost will be incurred and uh, why i am telling this no the it's a different region wise also and i told right for uh, different types of data image data video data tablet data and text data so different operations uh, is co costing this much for video data they define the different tablet data and the text data they are having like this 1000 pages means uh, it's like 1.5 dollars per 1000 pages it's analyzing the text in all the pages kind of thing so this is just for a data uh, training, I think, yes. Similarly, if you see for forecasting, I mean for prediction, for 1K data points, uh, this is the pricing. If you use auto ML, similarly, they are, they are having ARIMA plus, where it's just, they are having a batch price, sorry, batch prediction, uh, per TV, they are charging this much. Uh, training cost, uh, this is for all the regions, same cost. Explainability, if you want, uh, they have a separate pricing for that. Explainability, uh, model explainability also they are supporting. And if you have custom trained models, uh, it will use its own machine, GCP machine type. And based on the type of the region, the cost will change. If it is a, a predefined model, already existing model, there is no any issue. But if we want to have our custom model trained, then we have to select the different type of machines in which it has to be trained. Then for pipeline also, if you see here, the charges, uh, it's just the execution fee per pipeline run. You know, every day we may run the entire pipeline where it's going different stages and we will be comparing the existing model with the new model, but the cost is very less, 0 0.03 dollar per pipeline run. Only during execution, uh, this will be calculated, nothing much. So we should be very clear first about this pricing also before making some decision whether we can start using this kind of solution or not. And it's having multiple uh, session, sections also, it's using TensorFlow visor and uh, model registry where you can store the model model monitoring so all having a kind of different different pricing but it's all kind of less only based on your model size or the data analyzed per gp it will calculate the price okay so we were here in the first step data set i was explaining for different data set it, it can accept then there is a feature store here there are three ways through which you can get the feature. So you have you can have the entity type, I think, but currently they are not supporting it. Feature level monitoring no longer is available. So we can have ingestion jobs or we can have batch serving jobs. So if you click it here, ingestion job, so you can import the feature data from BigQuery or cloud storage. From external GCP service, you can ingest the required data. And similarly, if you for a batch serving jobs, uh, this is a, just showing the list of operation. Uh, we may have to do so much of transformation, right? As a part of every data batch. So we can define all those things here to define uh, the features. It do have labeling task. If it is unlabeled data, they were using their own labeling service. So Google itself having labeling service. So we can create a labeling 
task here but for that i think we have to have the data set even if your data set is unlabeled data set they are supporting labeling from its own i mean for labeling i think they are having their own models uh, which will give us labeling or they were using crowdsourcing data also for labeling purpose google's labeler workforce they were having but currently they are not having it so there are so many sections available let's see one by one and uh, they are doing distributor training again distributor means you know how big data can be handled or stored in hdfs right the similar way it's a kind of a split and train methodology where uh, they accelerate the training with the help of gpu they are doing a distributor training and uh, google is having something called google visor which can do the hyperparameter tuning and it's it's optimization algorithm which is uh, good in the hyperparameter tuning and it's using that uh, google's visor for optimization this is about training and if you see here how we can scale our uh, training with vertex ai it's a serverless training as i told uh, it's uh, using containers and it's using a distributor type so there will be so many clusters and each cluster will be distributed it will go to the data and it will get trained we'll we'll be having logging and monitoring whenever there is a issue we can quickly backtrack with the help of logs and uh, job queuing if we have less resources it will follow the automatic queue and pay for use these are all on demand service only if you request we will get it once we used it it will automatically decommissioned and i told her, there is something called visor sorry visor right it's visor not visor it's a visor so what it do it is very much helpful in hyper parameter optimization so it's a built in here in vertex ai and if you see they are comparing with the bayesian multi bandit and normal random search it's a better than that of uh, all those three with respect to hyper volume example here if you see i think they are plot against with number of suggestions uh, earlier bayesian was good uh, and uh, now multi bandit is uh, doing better and if you see visia it's uh, performing well or more than that of all of the above so they just uh, plot and show like how that visier is better in hyper parameter steering for a number of suggestions in the y axis they plotted hyper volumes so we don't need to worry about hyper parameter tuning much that's what they mean so they are taking care of best in class optimizer for our hyper parameter tuning so it's again i told it's a black box okay it's a black box optimization engine already all the google applications are using this optimization engine only if you want we can also use it so it's nothing but you know n number of data n number of combinations it is trying to uh, perform action and it's trying to find out the best right so different configuration it will uh, try with our ml model and will try to find the better one that is one thing second thing is model tracking so what is model tracking you know in machine learning operations i mean ml ops we will be having different batches of data and whenever we are training a model with a new batch of data we will be having that as a new version of model so we'll have n number of models if you see the right side image there will be multiple runs with the multiple data are trained with the model and we will be having multiple models with multiple accuracy it's not just accuracy we can have any metrics model metrics like auc whatever we want it depends on the model right uh, we can have any of the model metrics and we can have a dashboard like this they are calling it as experiment tracking so it tracks all runs and metrics in a central place so this is help us to decide which model is better and which one we can take and proceed with the deployment so it's a central dashboard for training evaluating runs across frameworks and environments in a single pan view 
you know if you see in the real time we will not go with a single framework right we may try with multiple frameworks multiple sets of data with a different hyperparameter tuning and uh, all we are interested in the one best model and uh, if you are trying different frameworks uh, we may not able to track it in a central place but here they are telling that uh, be it any type of framework say i am using pytorch i am using tensorflow or different frameworks i am using i'll be able to track it in a single central place if you use vatex ai so the purpose is we can visualize and compare multiple experiments here and it's giving us multiple metrics in the graph wise also like metric 1 2 3 like showing in the diagram in the right side and this is having option to share with our team also what i mean like like how we are sharing the other google related files and others can comment on it others can view on it it's a kind of dashboard or report we can share it with anyone so that uh, the findings can be easily spot and a decision can be quickly made if it is happening in one machine then uh, sharing the results metrics we have to generate our own report right uh, such things is not required you can just uh, share this dashboard with any of your collaborators this is one another place which is for experiment tracking i mean model uh, dashboard i can say and explainable ai you know explainable ai it's very important if you are product going to productionize a model you, we have to justify that uh, our model is working correctly so for that uh, we have to ensure how much it's reliable and uh, the explanation there are different explanations it's having in build and uh, it can give us a suitable output how much it's uh, reliable here is an example so for one prediction which are the data points it's considering for the prediction if you see here distance wise points it's considering here and temperature wise points it's considering here in such a way it's predicting this as a dog or a cat kind of it can, it's having its own explainable ai engine which can interpret our model and help us to understand how much reliable our predictions are and this is also having all the other other frameworks i mean related to explainable any question yeah google uh in explainable ai we have to write any explicit code to visualize the bad actions no it's not required there are uh, pre defined code code instead of code services are available here so it's nothing but you know which feature Uh, that we selected is responsible for the prediction. That's what okay. model explainability data, right? We may try with a n number of features, but maybe for the given input, uh, this feature is high, so that this uh, given input is classified like X or Y. So that's what explainability means. Uh, so here already we have the existing code or the service available. It's just that you need to pass the input. Uh, and you have to select your model and it will show the explainability is it applicable for speech speech vision translation also no for vision it's available speech or for text also it's available i mean for the sentiment analysis and all i know but speech i never heard because speech they are handling it separately through dialogue flow if you know earlier they were calling it as Uh, google voice assistant i think dialog flow so they are using dialog flow for uh, speech recognition and from that we are getting the uh, input for training purpose so speech i am not sure i have to check but text available a video available image available okay okay this can I be see. again further we can use it with our jupiter notebook and we can directly pass the data input from there and we can get the output so explanations are available because uh, we can blindly use the model in the production uh, even for if you are working for a customer right they need some confidence on our model for that uh, proving the model or explainability is very very important this is one of the feature which we can suggest if not uh, we have to again go with uh, any of the external 
I mean, we have to build a separate system for explainability where we can feed the model, feed the input, and system can tell us uh, how much it's reliable. It's a, another big project kind of thing, but they are having it as a part of uh, their own entire uh, suit itself. We have code labs also, so there are links available here. I can share this PPT with you. You can, so Bitly XAI notebooks. This is the link. Let me try to open it. So in the GitHub, uh, they have the Jupyter notebook uh, links using which uh, I think for one image, you want tabular data. They are checking all those things. It's under GCP, ML on GCP. So I can share this link. You can just go and see what they are having it in their notebook, okay? This is one another service for them. If you want, we can adapt it. Now, till now, whatever we have learned, okay. It's all related to the data science and model training. But we never uh, have seen how it's uh, going till the end user, right? I mean, the MLOps part, we have not seen it. So let's quickly cover that MLOps part in next 30 minutes. Before that, if you have any question, let me know. So ideally I have to cover all these tabs. So feature store is here, labeling is here. This is what workbench means. So in Workbench, it's a kind of another Jupyter notebook where we can perform any action, be it a query from directly a BigQuery, or we can integrate an existing notebook, notebook directly here, import it. So many things we can do it in this Workbench. For that, uh, we have to enable Notebooks API also because it's working on Notebook API. Notebook API, you know, right? It's a Jupyter notebook inside GCP. So these things are related to the model. Uh, I mean, data processing and model. Coming to the pipelines. So pipeline means it has to do all these process continuously. That's what uh, we usually call it as MLOps. And uh, machine learning is usually simple or it's, it can be quickly, easily achievable, but MLOps is not. So we were seeing till auto ML or how to create data set, how to train the data set that we have seen including explainability. But uh, we have to track the model, we have to evaluate the model, we have to deploy the model, including we have to create an endpoint or API so that we can pass the input and get the predictions. And we all know what is MLOps, that ML engineering culture and practice that aims at underlying ML system development and ML system operations. So it's a combination of both development or operation. We all know DevOps means, but here for machine learning, we call it as MLOps. So this is what we are usually say, launching is easy, but operating is hard, which means sometimes we may get a very bad data, very different data from the production, which may make our model underperforming from the benchmark or the uh, whatever the scale we already have. In that case, it's really hard to make decisions or uh, we have to be wise, right? We can't make the accuracy of the production model very less continuously because of the data issues. So the real problems with the ML system will be found while you are continuously operating it for a long term. So if you create a, create a model, if you just uh, show object with uh, I mean, a few objects and you are trying to predict it. If it is predicting correctly, it's not mean we are successful with that model. I think you all might have heard an interesting story a few days back, right? The Tesla's image classification is still not able to understand the, I think, Bullockart or Bullockart or something. It's trying to identify that as a truck. So in that way, you know, the more it's getting, a, a, getting the data, unseen data for prediction, the more problem it will, try to expose. So if you are operating it for a long term, then only we'll try to understand the problems in an ML system. And if you see here, the piece of ML code or model, whatever we are talking, it's very less in the overall system. The other work, whatever we are doing is what really big. And we need a lot of skills and the different set of people together should work to achieve or create this entire system. 
and there are so many challenges in productionizing ml model these are the challenges so scalability availability portability reproducibility this all uh, you know generically mostly for any systems and specifically if you see the for the ml systems governance of data features sorry governance of data and features so we all know always we will get a similar kind of data right model should not misbehave due to the data or whatever we are getting it may be a legitimate data but model is uh, learning and it's uh, maybe changing our hyperparameters and in such a way it's behaving in a different way means it's really not correct so governance is very important we should always keep an eye on our performance i mean performance of the model then features features uh, uh, we are often doing continuous feature changes it's nothing but the hyperparameter tuning also based on the current situation we may feel which feature is uh, dominant or which feature is less contributing accordingly we are always uh, prioritizing or updating the feature set in such a way we are trying to train with the updated data that's what so we'll get a number of models we'll have a number of pipelines and we'll have a number of experiments experiments here meaning displaying the matrices of different models and we have to do some hypothesis to know which one is better and continuous training and deployment so this is a very challenging part if you know earlier i was working in a bank uh, where we were trying to find out the fraudulent transaction with machine learning every day we will get a data at a specific time say they will put a csv file in a shared folder and our model should pick and it it has to do some kind of data transformation or a cleaning like it's changing the blank value so many steps we have some python scripts for that it will have to train the model and it has to give us the metrics we have a testing set right against which we will get the metrics so it has to give like that the challenge here is every day i i get the data but some day you know i i may get 300 mb 400 mb data we usually see the size of the data we won't count the number of data but we see 300 mb 400 mb so it may train for 5 6 hours and quickly it will give it but if, uh, sometimes i may get a 1.5 gb 2 gb and all so that time the entire life cycle takes more than 20 25 hours i mean 25 hours Uh, more than that more than one day in that case you know continuous training is not possible because before completing the training of the previous day data i'll get another set of data like that that kind of a backlog will come so continuous training will get delayed in that case you know i may need to add more resources in the back end to faster my training accelerate my training so such things uh, dynamically we can't decide it but if it is a scalable platform for training maybe we can help and training serving skew so uh, this we will see what it is and whenever we are doing a training uh, we will see some challenges there and data validation model analysis model analysis here again the hypothesis hypothesis testing or matrix analysis fairness and explainability it is still uh, behaving in a fair way and is it able to explain uh, whether the major parameters are still influenced or it's biased such things uh, we can't do for every every run or every model in the pipeline maybe before uh, putting something in the production we may have to definitely check the fairness and explainability because not all machine learning applications are just prediction okay uh, you all heard about lot of use cases uh, we are using ai for finding someone is a criminal or not in that case if it is uh, you know predicting incorrectly it won't be good right it it may create lot of problems it, model should not be biased uh, based on the color gender all those things no so for that uh, fairness is important explainability also very much important that again purely depends on the data we are passing if we never uh, trained with uh, some kind of data then it may feel like when it seen an unseen data it will be a biased model there are so many challenges so first what they are telling uh, they do have their own ml system right of course in most of the google applications they are using machine learning 
so they have been using machine learning for 15 years it seems and they have ml sres sres you know in devops devops we usually have site reliability engineers similarly for ml they have ml sres they have thousands of models with 100 billion parameters training concurrently concurrently means parallelly so every model is tr getting trained every day and parameters if you see 100 billion parameters this is what their overall production ml system and they told the model is continuously retrained with the new data every hour model continuously deployed in the global serving infrastructure because uh, every every data whatever they are collecting from us it's again fed to the machine learning system so that's what it's their own high level view what they are doing in google and uh, how they are doing it uh, there is a big history they are doing it uh, um, from i mean last 15 years they told right but they started publishing a lot of papers about their best practice from the year 2015 these are the papers and they have some ground rules also what we should do while productionizing ml model what we should not do there are some rules also they have it and based on all their best practice they are creating this vertex ai pipeline so at google a hybrid research approach where engineers and researchers are embedded together on the same team helped to reduce the source of friction significantly so usually you know in our most of the teams uh, researchers work in a different work differently engineers work differently we will just get the input from them and we will work on it changes will be suggested by the researchers but operations will be done by the engineers but they told a uh, uh, researcher and engineers should work together you know the freshness of the record these are some of the rules from the paper okay plan the launch and iterate now let's see how that vertex ai pipelines they are just telling that they are implementing all the best practice while creating a pipeline here it's not just a pipeline it's uh, having and they are a history of uh, how to train the models how to compare the models and productionize it so i told it's a serverless automated scalable pay for use pipeline and they are using kubeflow pipelines in the back end it can do data ingestion pre-processing training validation including deployment and you know there are so many artifacts we get it that we can track it and it can be stored somewhere and we can use it for reference or auditing purpose so let's see in video how it's happening okay this is the overall pipeline view i have the similar image in the upcoming slide also any ml pipeline will start from the data it can be a data ingestion system or a static data we will extract the data validate the data prepare the data train the model evaluate the model validate the model then deploy the model while training the model they are using different gcp services say they are using bigquery they are using serverless training in the vertex ai using containers the processing of data flow or data proc they are using for data processing and inference there is something called vertex ai prediction they have and to store the features or artif artifacts they are using cloud storage features they have feature store and this is a this is a one container and similarly they have n number of containers in their container registry this is a high level view it's about their metadata how they are storing it they mostly store it in a cloud storage there are multiple artifacts right uh, we may need to see the intermediate stages of the model what is the prediction what is the accuracy all those things so we'll be able to visualize it through this explorer if you see lineage explorer in the right side diagram at any phase we'll be able to visualize the model version what is the current precision recall RMSC value? If it is just a simple regression or classification model and the hyperparameters displayed, what is the data set? How many samples? What is the evaluation set? How many samples? So this kind of metadata at any time we'll be able to visualize it. And they do have Python SDK 
we can directly import and start running it like this. I mean, and not just running it, we can extract the data in our code, Jupyter Notebook also. It's not just that we can see this kind of matrices directly in the screen, and we can directly get it in our code also. So easily query and consume the metadata, pulling back to the data frame and the analysis. We use Python data frames, right? So it will come as a data frame here. It's just for metadata handling because metadata are very important for our models to make some decision whether we are going in the right track or not. So let's see, this is an example of going to a separate screen and opening a video. Look, if you're a business owner, then please, please, please don't make this mistake. Hello everyone, in this screencast, I'm going to show you how to create end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines using Vertex Pipelines, which lets you create and run pipelines on... Sorry, are you all able to hear the audio? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, then I'll... Be... On Google Cloud Infrastructure, it's a managed service, uh, supports pipelines written with the Kubeflow Pipelines SDK or the TensorFlow Extended, both are open source. The end result will be an end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline that creates a data set in Vertex AI, a tabular data set. It then trains a classification model on that data set using AutoML. It evaluates that model, and based on the model evaluation metrics, if the accuracy is above a certain threshold that we'll define, it will deploy this model to an endpoint in Vertex AI. This pipeline will train a model on the dry bean data set from UCI Machine Learning, which is a tabular data set for classification that takes various measurements uh, and data on different types of beans and classifies them by type into one of seven types of beans. We define our pipeline here, we give it a name. Um, in this case, this pipeline is using a few pre-built components, so let's see what it's doing. This component will create a data set in Vertex AI. In this case, we have uploaded this data set to BigQuery, so all we need to do is pass it to source. So that's the first component in the pipeline. The next component is also taking advantage of pre-built components uh, via the library that we installed earlier in this notebook. This is going to train an AutoML model on this data. Uh, we need to pass this component several parameters, including how long we want it to run training for, the type of model, in this case classification, and some metadata on the different columns included. Notice that we're also passing in the data set, which is the output of our last component. And finally, we need to provide AutoML with the target column, the thing we're predicting, in this case, the class. The next component in this pipeline flow is that custom eval component that we defined earlier. So we are just setting that up here. Um, and then finally, notice that this pipeline uses a conditional. So we basically want to take the result of that evaluation component, which is just a string indicating whether or not we should deploy this model. Um, and then based on that string, if it's true, we will run this next deploy component, which also uses another pre-built component, the model deploy op. This will deploy this model to an endpoint in Vertex AI uh, on a N1 standard four machine. So this is our complete end-to-end -end pipeline. Next, we will compile it, and then if I run it, we can click on the resulting pipeline run to see this pipeline graph in the Vertex AI console. So we can see that it's just starting out about to create a data set for us. Um, if we click to expand artifacts, we can see the artifacts that were generated from each pipeline step. In this case, this component produced a data set in Vertex AI. If I click on this URL, I can go to that data set in my console. We can also see the results of our AutoML classification component. And if we look at our evaluation metrics custom component, we can see here the threshold that we passed, which was area under the curve of 95% or higher. That will determine whether or not our model is deployed. We can see the evaluation metrics that we visualized in that custom component, including a confusion matrix for this model and the ROC curve. And then finally here, we can see that our deploy component was executed because this value was over our threshold of 95%. So we can click on this. We can see that our model was deployed. And if we click on this endpoint artifact, we can go to that deployed model endpoints in the Vertex AI console. And here's our endpoint that we can use to get predictions. Vertex pipelines also lets us do lineage tracking for each artifact created from a pipeline. So if we click on this view lineage button, we can see the lineage of this particular artifact in our pipeline. So that's it. Now you've learned how to create an end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline using pre-built and custom components. Thanks for watching. So here, if you see what uh, she was doing, uh, she just took a database, sorry, data set from GCI, which is classic, which is just for classification. We might have used for many of our uh, testing. So she was just uh, uh, training the data set or uh, doing a kind of small transformation and training using the AutoML classification model with the given features, uh, seven classes, I think she was using. And uh, with uh, small lines of code using the SDK, she's able to create the entire pipeline where she's just having a getting criteria. I think she's checking area under the curve, it should be greater than 95. So to deploying in an endpoint and we'll be able to give any kind of input to predict using that endpoint. 
we are able to see the model performance also in the dashboard. So it's a simple example how they get, they are doing it in an end-to-end -end way. And as I told, additionally, they have something called feature store also. So feature management is a very much painful thing earlier, but they told like, it's very much easy with the help of Vertex AI. And if you see here, feature management, of how we usually do in traditionally, whenever we are uh, doing a training, we will be having some features. And whenever we are doing kind of a prediction, we'll try to understand how much the significance the feature is while making the prediction. Similarly, when we are doing continuous training, we may have n number of feature sets. So feature management is a painful point, that's what. So training serving skew, what it means, uh, while we are doing continuous monitoring and uh, while we are checking or while we are comparing the results with the corresponding feature sets, we should be making the decision that, okay, this set is uh, what we need, which is helpful in creating a suitable model or very good model. So that kind of a decision we need to make from the feature sets. But uh, doing it manually is a really a painful job. What they are telling is, uh, they have there is no standard practice how to compute the features. Yes, we know that. When we synthesize feature offline, it's difficult to ensure uh, what user would have actually seen online. That is right. And every time while a data science needs to provide a feature for online serving, which is not using in the training, uh, you must contact the IT service and see whether this feature is available or not. So feature changing, it's not just I can do it myself. There are n number of people involved in this throughout the process. So we have to be in a sync while whenever we are changing the features because data engineer should be knowing about our change data analyst should be knowing about our change we have to customize our code also so ml engineer should need to know about that there are so many things but if you see vertex ai is having its own feature store so what it is having uh, it's having a, a feature store which can be reused during the continuous training and whenever there is a prediction, it will get the feedback and it will uh, re-update it. So they have an algorithm, uh, what it, they are doing it. I have a diagram, share, your reuse, share and reuse ML features across use cases, okay? It's a centralized feature repository, easy to, with easy APIs to search and discover the features. You know how, how we usually we see one feature is important or not, we do a lot of, test, right? Uh, we see the distribution. We see min, max, medium. Uh, we usually describe the data set and we see how much the, that is making decision or how much it's influencing the decision. So such analysis it's doing automatically, it seems. Mm, I'll, I'll leave a training serving skew, compute feature value once, reuse for training and serving, okay. Track and monitoring for drift and other quality issues. So it's having a number of feature sets stored and it's uh, continuously updating it whenever it's trying to find the best. And uh, whenever it's trying to find some drift kind of things, again, it's tracking and monitoring it. Accordingly, it's trying to give a feedback to the feature store. So what it is doing? features from a big query or a storage or a feature from an API, it's getting it and uh, it's having a store feature, online feature store overall. I think it's running very fast. Okay. It's getting feature from multiple sources, either pubs or a big query or a management, feature management API and it's storing it multiple levels, okay. Then from offline, sorry, from online, it's sending and using online survey. From offline, it's going to feature monitoring. Then from offline store, it's sending to the feature store before training it. So it's doing all the actions automatically. 
we can watch it once more. This is one feature they are claiming that yes, uh, it's automatically taking care of most of the things. And uh, this is telling that uh, they are preventing the data leakage, even though if some of the features are not having the data. This is an example. And finally, they have something for model monitoring and prediction. And this is the last part of the, uh, I mean, any deployment process, right? We have to predict it, we have to monitor it. So what they have is for, uh, they usually have uh, endpoints, online endpoints with the low latency for prediction. So it should be quickly predict as quick as possible. Even we can send a massive batches of data, like n number of CSV files, say, GBs of data we can send and we can predict it quickly. And it's very secure, they told, because uh, it's a connecting through a VPC, which will prevent cloud peering. And it's all communication is on encrypted, so nobody can tamper the communication or the data coverage. And it's having uh, low TCO. So it, it can automatically scale according to the traffic which means, uh, say, I, I, if I'm passing 2 GB of data to predict it, quickly it will scale and predict it. And uh, if I just pass, uh, say, 100 MB or 100 KB data, it will never scale. The existing resource sufficient to predict it. But it will always give the results in the given time. Within five minutes, means it will give us in five minutes, irrespective of the size of the, uh, or the number of batches, or the size of the data. So prediction is very easier here. Uh, I told you it's having built-in model explainability and model monitoring also possible. They are using a GKE, which is nothing but Google Kubernetes engines for auto scalability. They do have a log prediction request and response sending to the big query, which is helpful for a debugging purpose. Say some, for a specific input, uh, if you are not getting the desired prediction, we'll be having the logs, uh, which we can query using BigQuery for further analysis. And for inference also, they are having GPU support to do it quickly. So models trained with AutoML, unified endpoint experience, then models trained with a custom code. So both type of models, we can use it uh, in vertex prediction be it an auto ML model or a custom trained model, you can use it. And a prediction also, it's a scalable. That's what they mean. We can create any number of endpoints with the different versions. And who is using what and when they are using, it's a kind of big table they mentioned. But text training is used by data analyst, auto ML used by ML, driver, ML developer and data analyst. BigQuery and ML can be used by analyst, scientist, as well as the developer. And when they are using also, they mention just a kind of uh, uh, who is doing what in different components of Vertex ML, Vertex AI. And this is for explainability, why my model doesn't work. And they explained about screw and dipped and uh, how it's handling it. So I think similarly, there are so many things available here, but I think yeah, this is a quick overview. Uh, we just have a few minutes left. I can share this PPT with you, you can go through it. It's just that uh, they have a cloud solution with which they can do the entire end-to-end -end ML pipeline trained and deployed and they can do a lot of analysis with a uh, number of models to decide the best in class which can further going to the endpoint. So please uh, feel free to experiment this. Even I think with the free credits, it may work sometimes. We have a lot of labs available in Quick Labs using which you can go through each and every tab. You can find one of the sample data set and give a try. Uh, 